Hello and welcome to the fruit market. Um, welcome in the room. We have uh, people in the room and welcome on Zoom. Um, it's very nice to be here with Jill Bradley um, under her extraordinary exhibition installation Pardes. Um, just for the people who are joining us on Zoom, um, I should say, please do introduce yourselves in the chat. If you lose us, just log in again. If we if it all stops working, just log in again, we'll still be there. If there are any problems, if you're experiencing any problems, just put it in the chat um, and my colleagues will attempt to sort it out for you. Um, I'm Fiona Bradley. I'm the director of the Fruit Market. I'm delighted to be here in conversation with Jill. We'll speak for around 40 minutes and then there'll be a Q&A. If you have a question in the room, stick your hand up and go for it. If you have a question on Zoom, as I say, put it in the chat and Ruth will ask it for you. Um, I think that's probably it. Um, as I say, it's very exciting for me to be in conversation with Jill or to be in a kind of culmination of conversations with Jill, because Jill and I have been in conversation for quite a long time now about this work. Um, hello. Hello. <laughs> very nice to be here. It's very nice to have you here. I thought we would start off by talking a little bit about where the work takes its inspiration from. Where does it start, this extraordinary object? Well, this object starts, its genesis is in the growth structures of Scotland, which I researched um, after we first talked about this project quite a few years ago. Okay, so I'm going to stop you right there straight okay. away. Why did you research the horticultural? What, we, what, okay. was, what sparked your interest in the horticultural structures okay. of Scotland? So for the last, I guess, so for the last seven years, I've been really um, interested particularly interested in the structures that we build in order to bring light to a place, to a given place to grow something. Um, I've been interested in that as a, um, a practical um, thing of survival, but also as a kind of metaphor for the idea of the structures that we need in order to grow. So at its people. most basic level, greenhouses, conservatories. Hop gardens. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in the connection between growth structures in place. So um, one of my earliest works that, um, of which is just a relative, um, is called Green Light for MR, which was created for the folks in Triennial in Kent. And that's, that work was, um, it basically takes the form of a hop garden, which is very much a structure from my childhood. I grew up in Kent in quite a rural setting. And these structures were very, very important to, to me um, sort of spiritually in a way, but also practically, these are the structures that um, people build locally in order to, to thrive, to grow, to create a crop that they can sell um, and to come together as a kind of harvest. So a hop garden, is that is that quite so architectural as where I started with greenhouses? And because are there, there built elements in a hop garden? Yeah, it's a very, it's a very constructed, very built, um, very beautiful, um, kind of system of wires and poles and leans, which has developed over several centuries because people realized that hops had a huge hunger for growth. It's a very beautiful idea that this plant has got this immense hunger for growth. And they realized that hops like to grow to about 16 feet. So if anybody, if you travel through Kent, you will see these strange structures. They're kind of like the Stonehenge of Kent. Um, all through the landscape and there's something extraordinary about them their sort of system of of um architectural is a kind of combination of architectural and agricultural so, so these structures are for these plants that can't support themselves really that grow too long for their own good yeah so they would i mean if they were in in their natural states they would kind of like wander through hedges and um and climb up trees i guess but uh, over the years People have, have worked out a very beautiful system of, of um, how to grow them. And it, it's all to do with the kind of geometry of light. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of growth, um, as you can see from this piece as well, is a lot of growth is to do with um, leaning and reaching. It's not a lot of people think growth is a vertical thing. It's actually it's actually usually this gesture. If you think about trees or you think about um, hops as well, there's a, a geometry to the way that that a hop garden is strung so that the hops can climb up it so that the maximum light gets to that hop. And is that a, is that a tree working out how to get maximum light then? Yeah, I guess so it's kind of like it's literally branching out going like this to get to to get because you were going to get more light like this than if you're 
directly upwards like that, which is why we don't sunbathe standing up. <laughs> Correct. Makes sense. To That's me. right. That's true. So moving into Scotland then. So yeah. you, but the, so the hop garden is very much about where you're from and structures yeah. that you know and you've grown up with. And was it a way of kind of coming to grips with Scotland, really, being invited to make a work here, thinking, OK, let's start with the growing structures. Was there something yeah. of that in your yeah, research? Yeah, definitely. Um, I was I very quickly sort of started reading about some of the extraordinary, um, particularly orchard cultures and apple cultures that had grown up in Scotland. And also that I was really inspired by this idea that there's a loads of light in the summer and, and, and less light in the winter. It's quite a stark contrast. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of very beautiful and, and meaningful structures have been developed over the centuries in order to, to maximize that available light um, within Scotland. And I was also really struck by the um, extraordinary use of walls for for trapping heat. Mm -hmm. So this is another beautiful thing. I mean, if you've ever stood against a brick wall when it's on after a sunny day and the sun's gone down, you just get that beautiful heat. You can imagine how much heat that is being trapped in a wall. Well, that, that's the sort of feature of, of a lot of Scottish growth is, is espaliering um, orchard uh, trees and fruit bushes against walls in order to to maximize that light so there's something about there's something about the very sort of emotional the kind of human endeavor of how how to get the most from um with what you've got that really inspired me and were there particular structures that you visited could you point to one and go it looks a bit like that it looks a bit like that yeah so it's i i visited um uh, a, lots of different places. I, I was very inspired by a place Moni, called Moni Mail, where there are these extremely beautiful old um, walls which have got espaliered uh, trees. It's a kind of become a kind of community garden. Um, and these are remnant walls from a, a very, you know, and a much bigger, older estate that's now kind of um, not there anymore. But that was one place. And then um, I also visited Burke Hill where there's this extraordinary, very beautiful peach house. That's, I think it's probably one of the oldest glass houses um, in Scotland. And there's something extremely um, beautiful about that, that sort of delicacy of, of, this, of this kind of skeletal um, wooden frame and then, the, and then the glass and the way the two of them go together through leaning to create this to create this atmosphere, this space for for plants. I came with you to that place and I, I think I was struck at the time when we think of, I, certainly when I think of a glass house, I think of a kind of grand sort of botanical garden type Victorian structure, but that was really quite a, it was quite domestic. There was yeah. something quite Heath Robinson about it actually. Somebody yes. just saying, right, what does, I've got this wall, yeah. what can I do to make the peaches? grow better I kind exactly. of I think yeah I like that idea of a sort of human endeavor it doesn't yeah. have to be on a grand scale well I think it, it's also um, with this piece in particular I've been thinking about it, I've only just I mean that's the thing about you making a work of art and then and then you you're getting to know it mm. so one of the, the, the strong feelings I have with this work is, is um and, and I, I think the reason why I connect with that peach house is because I kind of grew up in a greenhouse so um what do you mean by that? <laughs> well i um so I, yeah i grew up in obviously there was a, there was a house attached to a garden and there was a um we had a very small um greenhouse quite an old kind of um wooden framed glass house and i used to spend enormous amounts of time in it when i was a young person and then when i was a young artist as well um and there's something about being in a space that is this frame, this beautiful frame um, with this roof that's inclining like this and where you're, whether you, where you can both be seen and, and see out at the same time. There's something about the transparency, the connection with, between the transparency and the structure mm -hmm. that I find, that I found very um, extraordinary. Uh, it also felt like a safe place. Weirdly, you think a, a you know a structure where you can be seen, it makes you more vulnerable. But I actually felt quite protected in this in this glass house, and that kind of emotional space is like really 
it's been very informative for certainly this work and, and, and many other works that, that are looking at the structural thing. I think as well, this piece is, it really um, evokes for me the thing of being in the glass house at night. Mm -hmm. I spend quite a lot of time in the dark in the glass house, but there was enough available light to see my reflection or to like draw something in my sketchbook or, or make some notes. And there was, and then my um, my dad would, if it was uh, supper time, my dad would get a torch and like flash it from the <laughs> kitchen window. Um, yeah, so I think that I, I'm I'm really yeah that's something that I've been thinking about a lot over the last couple of days is with in regard to this piece. It's it's a it's a kind of a nighttime mm -hmm. glass house. That's a lovely, yeah. I love that image because I, mean, I think we'll come on to talk about that a little bit later, that notion of making a space, what it is to, to be interested in the space that art creates for other people and for yourself. And so would you say it was the kind of atmosphere of a glass house as much as the physical structure of it that you were trying to create here? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. then that's sort of, uh, what's what's wonderful here is that you it's it's an in, enclosed mm. space. So. So some of my other works are very much like out in the world, you know, wind and rain and, you know, sun and all the rest of it. This has got this kind of, you know, mm. it's much more um, contemplative, quieter sense of light. It's not kind of all singing or dancing. Mm. It's so it's there's something I'm really fascinated by the containment of the of the space and the idea of the, yeah, the, the enclosed garden as well, I suppose that. The walled garden because that's something when we first started talking we first started talking about you making a work the works you'd made outside and one of the things that you said about sculpture which really resonated with me and was one of the reasons that i wanted you to be the first person really to make something think for this space was the way you talked about sculptures learning outside that sculptors were outside and people would learn about them but they would also learn about themselves as they lived their lives yeah. out in the world and i've yeah. always thought the art changes as we look at it, that as an exhibition unfolds, the art, the art changes as much as we change. And in finding out what this space can do, this is a very new space for us. Mm. This is only the second exhibition installation we've had in it. And this piece is helping us find out what this space is like as this piece discovers what it is. And there is something about that sense of questioning and sense of, of finding out its own identity that was intrigued me right from the start. Mm. And I think we're, yeah, we're learning about this space through this work, partly because this work reflects the space back to us in different yeah. ways. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's the thing about any work of art in particular, I, I think about it all the time with my work, but you know the idea that you make something and it's and and it, and then it's finished is a kind of a nonsense. It you make it and then you you create it and then you and then you drop it into creation. Creation is ongoing. It's like every second, the world is creating and recreating itself, hmm. and and you're kind of dropping another a new creation into that. And that's just the start of it. Um, and particularly with you know with some of my works that have been outdoors you then you start to get a lot of human interaction and and also with the materiality of the way that I'm working um in with this work and other similar you know work works that have similar materiality I'm really interested in that idea that the work sees us as much as we see it and the work sees its environment as much as um it's it's held in that environment and it's subject to that environment and to people and to all those things. So I love, one of the things I'm really enjoying is with this work is just how much um, reflection there is. It's, it's subtle, it's quite a lot of subtlety and there's a lot of reflection of the building back, the building speaking to the work with, and, the, and the work is reflecting that back to the building. And yeah, I'm really, I'm really thrilled that um, you say that it, you're learning about mm. space through this work because I feel that was one of the things that I really wanted to explore it just felt like such a an honor to 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 work in this space that I think I felt it was very important it was also a kind of that we use the work in order to see see and feel the space and see what the potential of the space might be not just now but 
in its future mm. life because it's such an extraordinary space. I and mean, it, yeah. it's got a super, its superpower is its height and its materiality. It's got a lot of superpowers of space. It's probably worth saying that for everyone, really, that it was a huge leap of faith for you to make this work. Because although you talk about using the height and using what this space can do, we had no, we didn't know what this space was like when we first started talking with Jill. It was still a nightclub and we couldn't see it. We had a sense from its upper floor, which we then knocked out to make the space what it might be like, what the materiality of it might be. But in a way, you were, you were, we were all questing towards what this space could be, whilst you were saying, could you tell me where the beams are? And I was yeah. saying, no, I can't, no idea. Uh, we'll tell you soon, but very, really, really quite late. So it is a great leap of faith, I think. And that would bring me to, I know one of your other sources, for the work, the, the light gathering structures, these mystical stone structures yeah. that have existed throughout millennia in, this, mm. in these aisles that we think are, are there about light and we think we, but we don't really know what they're about. And you've talked about that as being another of the antecedents of this work. Yeah, definitely. So um, I'm really interested in that connection between sort of Neolithic stone sculpt, uh, structures and agricultural structures, because um, stone structures were, these were created at a time when people were settling the land, they were becoming kind of agriculturalists, and and they're gathering places, so people realise that in order to, to, to grow or thrive and to, to survive, they need their crops to grow and to, to blossom, and I think these structures that people don't really know, but I think the idea is that the structures were built in order to create these spaces where people gather and, and kind of you know, um, ask for divine intervention of what, you know, quite often these were female deities as well, which is really interesting that they were calling to for the sun and the rain and um, to come at the right times. And I think there's something very beautiful about the way people would have gathered there in order to, to enact those. And then I, um, and then I thought, yeah, that's why I'm so, I, I feel so moved when I'm standing in the, like the Standing Stones in um, Orkney, which I love and visited a number of times. And, the, and at the same time, I have the same feeling when I'm standing in a hop garden in Kent. There's something about the, the verticality of the, of the structures that they are they're kind of speaking to, to the human, because mm. there's some kind of alignment between the vertical human and the vertical stone and the, and the hop garden. And I think that's I think that's really very interesting, and it's something that um, is sort of obliquely, but it's it's very much within within this work as well. It's like these structures that we need in order to survive. So in that in that sort of dual inspiration, I think you have kind of something which is at the heart of this work and a lot of your work, which is the combination of very natural materials. In this work, we have the wood and really quite man-made, unnatural human person-made materials, mm. very, very urban, sort of literally edgy materials. Yeah. So, so you often have this sense of, of the natural and the, the forced really, or the something that we've built. Can you say a little bit about the materials that you've chose I mean I, whenever you see a work I think when you live with a work as we have good fortune to do now you think it's just for you and it's been invented just for you and mm -hmm. it, I feel like no one has ever used this material ever before and it was created just for us and just for the particularities of this space but that's not quite true so yeah. tell us tell us about this this extraordinary greenness that we're surrounded by how have you how have you done that right so this about seven years ago um I I made this work that I mentioned earlier, Green Light for MR in Folkestone. And it was very, it was a very emotional work because I was born and adopted in Folkestone. And so it's extraordinary to be invited to the town where we were born and, and adopted to and created to create something new. And um, I'd had a, you know, I'd been in London for a long time. Um, I was, you know, in my 40s. And there'd been some kind of, I'd always felt throughout my life, there'd been this like big split between the very rural person that I was, the very nature oriented person I was as a child and then the, and then the urban person that I became. Were you in flight from the you sitting in the greenhouse? We, it, it, I, I was in, I, in a way I was, I maybe, I, I, yeah, I wanted a, uh, I wanted a bigger space than, than my greenhouse. 
so um yeah and there's a the whole thing about uh in those days about it's quite a small town and being queer and wanting to move away to to london and you know spread my wings and all this kind of thing and then as i got older it was like how do i bring these two aspects of self together this um because it's really part of my spirit my psyche is is this natural, natural so did you world. find it hard to be a young gay woman in a rural environment you felt yeah it's very it's it, it's difficult mm. yeah it's, it's certainly difficult um and so the materiality really comes from this this uh attempt to try to bring these two these aspects of self together and I came across when I was making the, the work for the folks in China, I came across this material, this um, live edge green plexiglass. Um, and I used it, I paired it with um, traditional hop garden materiality, which is uh, wood and uh, coir, which is like a coconut string. And somehow the, the languages, suddenly my whole world kind of came together. It was like this strange orbit had been mm. going on all this time and now suddenly I was caught in it so I've been using I've been using this combination of materials for for a few years now I'm I'm fascinated that these two material these two materialists can live and, and function in the same universe or in the same world tell us how it works this plexi the live edge so it's amazing stuff it what it does is it sucks in any available light so absolutely any light it will suck it in and then it like pushes it out at the edge. And even that is something I, I find very kind of moving about it, if you can be moved by plexiglass, which I, I am. Um, it, it, is, it is a light, it's a light seeking um, device. So it is like all those structures you talk about. It, yeah. is, it is like a structure to grow something or a, or a fruit in itself. It's something that yes. stores light and then gives it back to us. Yeah, it's, it's kind of it's quite an optimistic material. I mean, I'm by nature an optimist and there's something extremely optimistic about live edge plexiglass as a kind of characterable thing. I think what I do with it that is, is important is that I, um, I try and free the edges. So quite, a, you know, people, a lot of people have used um, this plexiglass, but quite often it gets um, encased, the edges somehow get encased in, in, into something, into a frame. And what I'm, what I'm always interested in doing is what happens when you just allow, allow it to kind of float through space. So actually one of my favorite um, views in this exhibition is um, where you look through the kind of progression of, of these live edge um, pieces and you get this kind of it, they they sort of speak to each other and they start to merge and they almost look like a kind of green haze which is mm. a strange idea for something that's actually solid and well I guess it plays with with the art historical heritage of this work which is yeah. minimalism yeah and you're playing the the line off against the plane you know it, it forms a grid it doesn't form a grid you're looking at a two-dimensional thing you're looking at a three-dimensional you're looking at a single line it seems mm. to to me, it seems always shifting with a really reduced means between line and plane and grid in quite a deliberate way or, also you, you, or you've set it up deliberately and then you've let it run riot. I have I have set it up deliberately. Yeah, because there's something about the geometry of growth mm. that I'm really interested in the, um, the, the sort of geometry of planting and, um, and, the, and yeah, the methods that you use in order to give enough space for each plant or each um in the hop gardens there's a there's a particular amount of space from one hop to the next in an orchard as i discovered when i was researching this is particular number of steps that are recommended that you take there's a kind of performative stepping in order to then plant your tree that's really nice which is it? yeah which is really it's it's really beautiful idea. and you think that's more important to you than the than the minimalist grid it's it's more a how you get plants to survive than your place in art history or what the grid, the I know, grid the place in art his, that's the art historical thing is very important i mean that was something that i that that's been the kind of cornerstone of my work since i was a young student at goldsmiths mm. um the first works that i made 
were light works. Mm -hmm. I've always used light, but my those works were um, related to. I, I was the first person to actually to use the light box in the UK as a as a formal um, piece, and I was really interested in how you could use how you could draw. Sort of so a light, a light box is is uh, for younger members of the oh, audience yeah. <laughs> is a box that you would you would use to look at a slide or a transparency. It's or a, for it's advertising. A tool. It's really an advertising yeah. tool. And I was yeah I was uh, so that was my that was my introduction to minimalism was um, literally wandering around London and bit and feeling having come from a, quite a, a place where there was not much light because it was a rural setting. Suddenly I'm illuminated by light. What's what's that about that's interesting that um i'm suddenly illuminated by um urban light mm -hmm. so that was that was the kind of starting point for an interest in, in minimalism and also its sculptural um possibilities because it's not what you would expect i don't think when you when you hear the story of, of horticultural structures and researching scottish growing systems i don't think you'd expect something so pared back and so minimalist it's, there's very little narrative in it there's very little there's, there's very little adornment it's one of the things i love about it is that you have all this sort of hinterland this incredible narrative hinterland but what you're faced with in the gallery is something mm. incredibly austere actually mm. and minimalist yeah I mean, it's. I think it's because I. I wanted to. There's a few reasons why I pared things back. I mean, the work has developed over over a few years. At one point, it was quite elaborate, and actually, what happened was that I decided over. I think over COVID as mm. well. I just felt that this was a time when I was really thinking about what's essential. What What do we? What do I need? What do I not need? Um, what's important? what are my values and I I what I did was I, I I think I freed the structure by by taking things from it and therefore I want I, I free the space and give them more space to the space so that's really the um I think that that's a very important part of the work that it, it is yeah it's, a, it's one of my most abstract works but it yes it has all of those uh, connotations those narratives within it so uh, talking a little bit about covid I mean, it must have been an, it must have been an extraordinary you know, we talked regularly throughout lockdown which was incredibly sustaining for me but it must have been an incredibly odd time for you planning this very very physical material work in a very material place that you couldn't visit and that yeah. you couldn't be out in the world gaining inspiration did it it must have made you sort of crawl inside your own head in quite a strange way yeah it did actually i mean we have that said we have this incredible opportunity to to work with scottish ensemble is at um scotland string orchestra or well, not orchestra but they're an ensemble of string musicians and they um commissioned a film where and in the film it's, it's called pardes and in the film you see me making a model of of this work and so it was a i think that really helped me actually mm -hmm. was making it making the physical model of the work felt like we were still making it was still happening and it and, and i was still involved in the making of it um so that was a really important and it probably helped you abstract it actually thinking about the film you made which is in i would urge everyone to watch it is a very abstracted animated it, it, you watch it and it's like watching music if that makes any sense maybe yeah. that helped you pair it back and think about how how the work would function on a, on a different kind of a plane yeah definitely no it really did and there was a key moment where i i had the model in my studio and i thought what do i need and, and what can i what what isn't needed and i and i also realized that the what's extraordinary another superpower of this Base is the beams mm. and the, and I just thought I want the, I want the sculpture to freely fly through the space and through the beams. So so literally it it starts very very high up and then it flies over the top of one set of beams and then under another set of beams, and on a very simple level again it's just kind of going back to the what's important. There was something about the space that the only missing dimension was the was a diagonal so it was a very it was a very kind of um simple mm. desire to to 
because you've got these huge upright structures and you've got this structure, but what you haven't got is the lean, the sort of leaning into. Yeah, so it's curiously obvious thing to do. Never, yeah. be, never be afraid of the obvious, as Nick Sorota always says, which I really like. It's just like the one thing that isn't there. Mm. And it shows up very beautifully what is here, but it also, in some ways, it takes no account of what's here whatsoever. Mm. It looks entirely accidental that it starts up there, it finishes down there, and it doesn't hit any of the beams at all. Extraordinary. Mm. I mean, obviously, <laughs> quite a bit of planning. Yeah. But it does have this kind of like it does doesn't care it's mm. doing its own thing it is doing its own thing yeah it's yeah it's just flying through space and it's and it's creating space and then and then and then down here it's i mean hopefully um when you what's what i love actually is you when you walk around the side you there's a point at which you actually can't see into this space so mm. what i was trying to do as well was to create a space that's got a kind of intimate moment and then and then a much wider space for um other things other creative people to mm. to do to do things so it, it's got both of those kind of qualities to it i have brought people in before this work was installed i brought people into this space that have found it quite frightening found the height of it quite frightening mm. and they've found that side because there's more beams over there a bit more reassuring because oh. it isn't quite so high and there's something about this that this work does that as well i think it creates a sort of reassuring space i want to talk to you about the title but mm. first of all i want to talk to you about this idea of inviting other people in so you've talked about the collaboration with scottish ensemble during mm. lockdown when you're making the work but you you've talked you sort of alluded severally in this conversation to this notion of a gathering place and bringing yeah. people together tell us about that it's, it's a rather strange thing in a way an extraordinarily generous thing for an artist to invite people in to do whatever they like yeah in a space well to go back to the kind of um the idea of the the standing stones and also the mm. um agricultural structures these are these are gathering places they're places where uh, if you if you've ever been involved in a harvest which i have because i grew up in kent it's a it's a time when you meet the maximum you meet people coming in to to work together and um and to 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 reap the harvest. I mean, in a way, I love that metaphor that, you know, without um, harvesting, the value of your work is, is there's no value in, in the work that you do. That's lovely. And it's a similar notion with um, anything in life, really, if you don't harvest um, or celebrate what you do. And share the harvest, and share I suppose. It. It's too you much for you. It. Yeah, to share it. So um, the there's that idea. But the other thing is that what I found from my experience of making other works is that people started to ask me if they could do things in my other works. So my work at Folks and Triangle, for instance, and my work at Turner Contemporary. So there would be all these kind of spontaneous um, happenings. Yeah, because I think you sent me during lockdown, you sent me, or, before, or maybe it was before lockdown, but I was up here and you were in London, a picture of somebody doing football training. In yes, the work right. in, yeah. in <laughs> yeah, Margate. Was, yeah, yeah, they just decided that was a really good place to make a football training video. And they weren't fussed whether it was a sculpture or not, it was just a good place for that video. And so it gave me the idea what what's great about working here is is that we're not um, at the behest of the weather quite so much, although um, we were on yeah, we were rather on the opening. We did manage to yes, we opened into storm our wind, yeah. which is possibly not a good idea. But the great thing is that um, what this work can do is hold the space for people to to create things and and because it's indoors, it means that things can be um, safely programmed so that you know it's not going to rain in mm. here for instance we hope so i think the i think the, i love the idea that you make a work you create a work and then that work then becomes um a site for other creation mm. and it's a sort of ongoing cycle of creation and you pass on the baton to somebody else to to make something or make of it what they will and i'm, I'm just so curious as to having seen how people have responded to my other works um what people would make of this of this mm. work as well that i was struck in the context of this um in one of the obituaries of lawrence Weiner, who died recently somebody quoting him as saying that all he feels art is is giving somebody something they can use 
Oh, that's really interesting. It's lovely, isn't it? It is. It's kind of like, I, I really like that pragmatism. Mm. Yeah, I think it's that it's the mix of the pragmatism and the kind of the mystical side of things, which are, especially with horticultural, agricultural structures, there is that thing of it's a practical structure, but you put so much hope into it because mm. you need it in order to, you need to work. And I suppose then that's back to notions of control and whether you how much you're determining what people can do with it how they will use it I mean I always think of especially the ones in Orkney because they're much less um sort of mediated than a lot of the stone structures down south that you can you know, spend time with them and make of them what you will and yeah. do with them what you like you can have a football match in the standing stones or you can yeah. you can do things with them that you you know that they're not for but you can enjoy imagining what they might be for mm -hmm. and I suppose in this space we have that anything from somebody wanting to just sit quietly and write something to, to a dance group wanting to make something yeah. Or a club night. So we had a club night tomorrow night, I believe. Oh, we have, we have music. a club night. Yeah, we, we have, have music, music night. And then we also have um, a uh, full on club night mm. in uh, April toward the end of the exhibition. And that obviously, you know, we're sitting in a space that was, was a, nightclub. a nightclub. Yeah. And it was a play, you know, nightclubs are about light. Um, and also, this used to be a fruit warehouse. So it's like this idea of store, this, you know, to, to create a fruit is a kind of storage vessel for light as well. So there's that idea of um, storing light and holding, holding space. So really you've done all that, not necessarily with what you've made, but how you've made it or how mm. it inhabit, how it's holding the space and how the space is holding it. Mm. Yeah. Tell us about the title. Why is it called Pardes? What so does Pardes mean? Pardes is a, an ancient word for a fruit orchard. And it's got a lot of, um, it comes from a Farsi word, pardisu, the enclosed walled garden, and then goes through Hebrew. And then there's um, obviously paradiso in Italian and paradise as we know it. And I just wanted to use a word that had that um, connection to something that we know, hmm. which is paradise, the idea of paradise, and the idea that of, of, of a walled garden. And the idea that, um, as well that this is a kind of site of, of creation which we, you know we we think of um culturally and also a place where there's cultural exchange because i think for me that's a really important this this is a place of cultural exchange because pardes is a word that happens in many cultures and religious traditions yeah mean. and 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 it's a, it's also a site the, the idea of a walled garden is a site where um poets would gather where people would um picnic um where a lot of beautiful poetry is written and all these kinds of things it's a it's a kind of a holding space that that relates back to that but it's also a um the word itself is also a a, a, a term for an interpretation of text in the hebrew tradition and it's also, and it's to do with levels of interpretation levels of understanding so, so it's an acronym. Isn't it's an it? acronym. An acronym. Yes. So take us through that. So there's lots of lots of. I've got them written down. So oh, yeah. I, I, <laughs> yeah. But there are yes various levels of understanding. Which yeah. Of course, all art takes us down exactly. ladders of yes. levels of understanding, doesn't it? We yeah. we can we start to look at a work and we think, oh, what are you? What are you doing? What are you making me think? What do you? Where where can I go with you? What do you? What's your? And but this notion of pardes that you you introduced me to is a, is a very specific way of doing that, really, of taking us yeah. there. So the P it's, is it means the pashat, which is like the literal or the plain, simple meaning of something. And then remes is about the symbolic or the allegorical. And D is drash, is the metaphorical. And then the sod level, the S, is the hidden meaning um, or the kind of um, more esoteric meaning of something. And that's, that's something that um, I'm really interested in this work is, um, is is uncover what are the hidden meanings within within the work and that's i think it, the, through the course of its life that's what we'll be kind of uncovering yeah through, they're through not hidden activities. meanings that you've put in there no 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 it's not hidden meanings i put it's it's what 
Although it's there is the, a secret in the space that you can find. That is, but we yeah, can talk yeah. about that later and see yeah, if anybody yeah, yeah. spotted. But that's Definitely. not really, I'm trivializing no. this system now. But it's yeah. not that you've deliberately made this work on these four levels. No, but you no. make a work or you write a poem or you do, do yeah. something, it can be interpreted in these different ways. Yeah, I think ways. it's a really useful way of, um, and I'm, I'm really pleased you use the word ladder because obviously I think there's a, I think the idea of ladders is really mm. interesting. I've always loved or been interested in ladders and there is something about that as well the thing of there is something against. yeah a ladder leaning and though, yeah. though i am not climbing all the way up there but there right. is something about that that's how that is how we reach yeah. how we reach for yeah it's how we reach for the stars isn't it we, exactly. we climb a ladder yeah right. or pick a fruit so yeah i saw a lot a lot of ladders on my uh journeys through scotland in different places yeah so is this system of, of interpretation, this system of meaning, has it been sitting there in all of your work? Um, Rosie, you've, you've named this piece after it. When did, when did that come to you, that Pardes, has Pardes and this system always been, obviously it's always been together. So you yeah. thought that, both, was this a time for you to make that slightly more explicit? Because I remember when you, the reason I asked this is when you first told me this, you mm -hmm. said, possibly only for you. Yeah. This is, and then we talked about that, and I think it's such a fantastic way of thinking about I all think it's art. A great, I think it's. I just thought, no, this is absolutely right because it's it's such it is the way that I think about art. Mm. So, in that sense, it's it's very autobiographical. Mm. In that, this is my. I mean, it's a wider way for anybody to to look at art or text, but that this is my personal way of looking at something as well. So that's I guess what that's what I'm. I use it to encourage people to look at the work in a lot of different levels. And some people will come in and just go, you know, they'll, I mean, it's with, with any art, um, people go, they're interested in the color of something, I might paint my wall that color. And other people will be looking for, for different things. And some people, it's, I just think, um, yeah, I think it's, a, it, for me, it's a way of understanding the world. I like structures, mm. obviously. So uh, it's a really interesting way of looking at it. Amazingly, we're, we're getting through the time, but oh I wanted gosh. one of the strangest thing, you know, this is a new thing for us, inviting an artist to make one thing in a space. And I'm aware that it's the tip, this work is the tip of a very large iceberg. Huge, a vast. huge, vast iceberg. You have, yeah. uh, you have a, a whole, a gallery-based practice mm. and a public art practice and there are yeah. things that we that this work partakes of and helps us think that we don't know about your practice and I wonder mm -hmm. I wonder how it feels to you to relate this to your other kinds of work your your more your smaller more gallery based practice and your other kinds of work Jill I should say is a photographer and a filmmaker as well as a sculptor also a writer you are a polymath you your your way of thinking encompasses many things yeah what would you in a way what would you like to tell us that we don't know that we haven't got here what should we know um what you should know is that one of my ways of understanding my work is making films of mm. my sculptures and we we are we have already shown the films once but we're showing them again that's one of my kind of contributions to mm. the gathering place and the place where other creations are either made or exhibited so this is quite a recent thing um i realized that a way of understanding my sculptures which was in the, in the public realm and this work as well was to spend a lot of time with them and mm. to start photographing them and through photographing them i started filming them and filming their life and it's through that that process that in in a way all of all the elements of my practice have come together through that um, through the filmmaking so i think that's something that um it's very important. So that's a, and kind of, what do you exactly mean by that? What can you do in a film that this lacks? What does a film bring to this? Can we film, speak in those terms? It's, I suppose it's the it's that esoteric, the hidden level. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, um, the work in Folkestone has got this huge personal story woven through it that you would never know mm -hmm. if you just saw it, mm -hmm. if you saw that sculpture. I mean, the sculpture is hugely loved for lots of reasons, but and part of the reason I made a film called MR, which is um, we've shown here, and we're going to show it again, is because um, I made I made the film because through woven through that piece is the story of my birth and adoption in Folkestone, and it was and lots of people just I felt 
I really need to tell I really need to tell this story because the, the because the, the sculpture for me um, is a metaphor for an, a um, re reminder of that for me. So it's an extraordinary thing, really. The work exists. This, this piece in folks is again a very abstracted, mm. made of made of natural materials and live edge perspex. These wonderful verticals that inhabit a form of gas yeah, site. Yeah, uh, gas site. So yeah, it's this ra beautiful works. round structure of lovely green light, warm green light. And in a way, you've you've made that work abstracting from your story, taking all the personal in a way out of it. Yeah. And then is the film a kind of reflooding of the work? Yeah, with, it with is, its in a weird way. It source is. material. Yeah, in a way, in a way, it is. But it's also saying, actually, this is my story, but everyone's got a story who comes to this place, and you know that's what I hope people coming here will find that. You know, everybody has a story about why they happen to be coming here or seeing this and what it might evoke or not evoke. So I think that's that was that was the other reason for my I was thinking, like, I want to show the potential of something so slight, because in a way, there's a lot here and then there's not a lot here. And it's the same with all of my work. There's there's a there's a lot and there's and there's also vast amounts of space between it's, it's, they're all permeable enclosures in a way. Do you think it's because there's layers of not here? You know, whether it's just because I know this, I know the amount that's been taken away from this. Mm. But I don't think it's that because some days you walk in the space and it seems really full of yeah. this work. Yeah, yeah. And other days you barely know it's here. Yeah, exactly. You wander through it and you forget to look up, or you just it's, and that's not just the, your frame of mind. It's just some days, some days the the work is hiding or yeah. it doesn't want to be seen particularly. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it has it. It has its own life. It has a art has a private life mm -hmm. or a secret life, and it's not. You know, some days it's like on point and feeling like yeah, but it's reflecting your emotions. Yeah, it's of reflecting course. what's going on in your yeah emotions. Um, Talk yeah. to us about the color green. Green. Well, I mean. What can I say? I mean, it's because you've used green and you've used orange. Sometimes you've used them orange. together. That was a very particular um, use of orange. The green is really it's a regenerative color. It's become I mean, this this material, this kind of particular green has become this real kind of alignment with certain aspects of self and the, and the sharpness of the line and then the this juxtaposition with the translucency of, of how of that materiality. So obviously, you know, there's obvious things around growth and regeneration. And but there's also negative connotations of green and edge. You know, you can think of green as being inexperienced, as being foolish, as being unsophisticated. Yeah. And obviously something that's edgy, it's not necessarily at ease with itself. Is that is that in here as well? That sense of slight unease? Um, Awkwardness? I actually know. <laughs> I say no, it's totally not. good. No, not really. Um, I think it's about for me, it's to do with joy. Mm -hmm. I just find I find unbelievable joy in this in this uh, materiality and this green. So do we. Just saying that now, there is time for some questions. If there are, I think there are some questions online. Are there questions? Shall we go to a question from our online audience while our in the room audience gets to think about it because they haven't had been able to write them down as they go? Are there questions online? I don't know whether people online will have been able to hear that question. They won't. Yes. Yeah, so perhaps you could repeat the question in the. Okay. It's in the chat. Okay. Sorry. So, sorry. Could you? I'm um, sorry. Could, it was quite a long question. Would you mind repeating it a little bit? In a way, yeah, I would I would think so. I mean, actually, one of the one of the one most wonderful days is when I I went to Newbra, and I met loads of people who are, um, who have got relics of of 
really ancient orchards in the gardens. In my gardens. Because yeah. Newborough is, is, as you probably know, it's on a slope. So there's another it's a sloping element to Scottish growing that's really important, this leaning sloping. So um, I was really struck by, Hatford, by the connections that people had between each other and across their gardens with their different um, apple orchards. So yeah, I guess in a way it is a, it is a celebration of, of that. So you're trying to keep those the spirit of those communities because there's also I mean the, your research has been extremely extensive, hasn't it? Yeah. You've, you've researched religious communities and and the way in which religious communities in in Scotland got their inspiration from religious communities in France. France and is yeah. is there something? Do you? I mean, I think it is a lovely question. Is is there something of a of a celebration or a preservation of some of that? All of those kinds of communities in here. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's also because you can't with a fruit tree, you have to tend it mm. with something that's agricultural you can't just let it go wild you have to learn how to prune it and graft it and and so these these traditions and these um so in Nubra they they have a society where people learn how to prune and graft and and then people give each other grafts and and there was an exchange with the the monks that brought um this apple apple culture to Nubra they, they also would take grafts of, of apples away to their, is it a convocation, where they all meet up once a year um, in, in, in different country. They would take grafts of, of trees that are particularly good and exchange them. That's really nice, yeah. isn't it? So I think that, yeah, I think for sure it's a sort of passing things down through the generations. And certainly in, in Scotland, I felt like, there's a lot of interest in the orchard revival, mm -hmm. in the revival of, of ancient orchards. Because at one point you were thinking you were going to incorporate names of lost apples I or did, lost yeah. trees into that. It's one of the things that fell away. Yeah, I think I wanted to make, I, I decided to make something more, that was more elusive and more universal, but we can, we work with those names. In fact, I was hoping Ian might be interested in with those names what proclaiming the names well it, i did it was one of the things you you did ask me about ian sorry ian's off camera but um i will supply you with some extraordinary names and maybe we can come up with something or, or maybe you'll be inspired i mean there is but something sure isn't there about the listing book. and naming yeah. and bearing witness that is exactly. somehow in the atmosphere of this work but yeah yeah for sure nice are there more questions in the room or online? I think Ruth, not Ruth, but the online audience has another one. And there's one, so we go, let's go in the room first and then online. Ah, okay, we're not gonna reveal it. Does anyone, has anyone, has anyone spotted it? The moment of extreme representational narrative in the room. Have you Have spotted, you spotted it? it? Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> Above our, I don't know if you can see it on, you probably can't on camera, but above our heads, there's an owl sitting. This is the first time I've placed a representational object in any of my sculptures. So it's Do quite... feel free to get up and move around so yeah, you can yeah, see it. Yeah, you want to see it. <laughs> you do it after. So tell us about the, so there's a, there's a, there's a model of an owl, but it's, it's yeah. quite frighteningly lifelike, actually, it's, when you it's, catch it's sight it's, of him. It is. Um, Tell us yeah. what he's doing up there. So one of the places I mentioned that I visited was Burke Hill and um, this beautiful, quite modest peach house. And on that day, we had, we met um, Siobhan Dundee, whose peach house, who she tended that peach house. And um, she really, she was an extremely warm and, and just full of life woman. And during the course of, um, creating this project she very sadly passed away and I I was I was very really affected by it and I thought how can I kind of bring her presence in into the work somehow and I remember I went through all my photographs of the peach house and I and I found the that there was an owl on one of on the peach house and this is a, as you probably know is a um, humane form of pest control so I wrote to um, Lord Dundee and asked him if I could borrow the owl for the course of the exhibition. And so the owl is 
So he's a, he's a kind of, yeah, he's homage to Siobhan Dundee. And yeah. he's also, I like, I think it's, I mean, we did, hum, we did hum and haw whether we would include him or not, whether it was just a bit too narrative, a bit too representational, but it's something about the natural world, even if he's an unnatural representation of the natural world, just kind of edging its way in, I think works yeah. incredibly well. Yeah, it's exciting for me as well, because, you know, it's, it's a very abstract sculpture and then you've got mm, a little kind of and I yeah I like I really yeah I'm very excited by that in, yeah in so it's dramatizing that. that contrast in a way yeah it's it really nice it is and I, yeah and yeah so thank you for that thanks <laughs> are there, can are you there see it can you see yeah. it oh great oh really oh, oh wow oh right oh. so that's that's nice Oh, that's so nice to hear. It, I keep it, meeting it, people like that. I met somebody at the opening. He was also a family friend. <gasps> oh, she wow. was a very friendly and warm woman. Yeah. That's so lovely. Oh, thank you. Good. Oh, I'm really touched. I know. That's lovely. Yeah. You see, it's a piece that creates, it gathers things. Yeah. It gathers things. Are there other questions online? Oh, okay. Oh. We'll rattle on. <laughs> well, Well, give us time. That's what I would say. But is, is that a question for G what's going to happen to the work? Out? What happens well, to your works when they cease being where they are? Well, most of my works are in residence in place for many years. Um, but recently, um, the work that I made at Turner Contemporary that had been on exhibition for four years, and recently we took it down. And so we've repurposed the material. I'm making a set for a young dance company out of the materials so um i'd imagine that we'll probably do something similar here i mean the what i love the idea that that you can upcycle artwork so that's it will be upcycled it's an extraordinary life cycle i think especially of large sculptures that they start as material and then they become art and then they return to being material again mm. and if they're lucky they get to be art again but it is that moment when a sculpture ceases to be a sculpture again and it's back to its constituent parts is amazing i think yeah sorry i've answered enough questions so back to back to our audience online Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know if I can talk about it really. Um, I this mean, is I the can rhythm talk, question. For yeah, people. I mean, I can talk about it in terms of the rhythms, the rhythms of the natural world, of the cycles of the seasons, the um, rhythms of planting, all those kinds of of, of rhythms. Um, rhythms in music. I mean, I I listen to music all the time. And I have like, you know, there are certain musicians and music that's incredibly important to my works, especially um, a lot of musicians that use repetition and um, like Steve Reich have, um, have made a film based on his music or use, working with his music. But I, I don't really know a lot about music. Um, so I'm not sure if I can talk about the rhythms within yeah, although I, I suppose mean, one of the things this piece does is set up a rhythm in the space doesn't it yeah it, it has its own rhythm. rhythm it encourages you to walk rhythmically around it it does i think it is a very rhythmic that's true yeah yeah use of the space it's a, it's a nice thing to think think alongside yes. the work with actually yeah. in terms of rhythm i like it um Um, could you sorry could you repeat the question i think that's very interesting i think that's something that actually that you said a while ago this in my work there is this uh juxtaposition between restraint and abundance hmm. and i think 
that kind of touches, I think that touches on what's... Well, your work, with, I mean, it, that's why that I always come back to that when we talk about your work, we, we do, you do, one does get quite nostalgic. You go back into these historical orchards, Siobhan's Owl, there's an awful mm -hmm. lot of, of sort of love and care and a sort of flowering of narrative and humanity and nostalgia for all that. And then you just slice it all out. Yeah. Really, and you make this very rigorous, minimal thing it's all sitting there and all the layers and the ladder of meanings that you talk about with the title of the work but actually it, it is kind of thrown overboard really yeah I wouldn't say I'm, I don't wouldn't say there's nostalgia that's no. not something I'm interested in but I am interested in, in um bringing forward you know the what what aspects of yourself yeah. that you do bring into the present from from the past that's a lovely way of putting it and of course yeah. abandonment's a very emotive word for a kind of letting go or a, I mean yeah. not, you know that's one of the things that I love about artists you're all very very good at deciding what to leave out and you know cutting things away until the thing that's left is really jewel -like. It's like a mineral it's like the, the the job with an artist I think for me anyway is you want to suck everything out that that that's, that doesn't need to be there it's like it's like a mineral I mean, that's a, a, a good poem is when you know there's nothing in there that, that should, should still be in there. It's, you've had the bravery to like prune it and graft it and, and just not be sentimental. I think I'm very against being sentimental about the work and that you've, and that you've got to be tough and you've got to, it's got to be, yeah, mineral. It's a kind of mineral feeling. There's something mineral about about this work for me. I think that's probably a perfect way to leave, perfect place to leave this conversation, a sense of a mineral clarity and a mineral hardness, yet that at the same time is welcoming and generous. Can you have a generous, generous hardness? I don't know. But I think that's that's one of the paradoxes of this work, because that's what we have. We have something that you have boiled down and distilled and turned into this wonderful, glowing essence that at the same time you're inviting people to come and think what they want and think how they want and literally wrap themselves up in a blanket and have a glass of mulled wine of an afternoon if that's what you want to do which is an extraordinary thing i think it's it's it balance this work balances a number of contradictions and i really love that so will those of you in the room and those of you online please join me in thanking jill for the work and for your extraordinary way of thinking and your generosity in bringing it both of those things here thank you Thank you.